Dems for the chance to uh, address uh, your organization. Uh, I'm particularly um, privileged to be in the company of two other women uh, who are running, um, who are here tonight because we all believe in the importance of uh, women running, qualified women running for office. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the group. Uh, I think we're seeing now with our first uh, ever female vice president coming to the White House, um, which is great. And also uh, I have a personal story about your neighborhood. Um, one of the first events I did as a political organizer was with Claire McCaskill, who at the time was running for the US Senate. And we did an event at Catra, which I know is just a, a block or so north of where you are. But we put her on the on the landscape uh, nationally as a result of that event. So we owe a lot to some of the small businesses and bars in your neighborhood, um, thanks to my uh, leadership at DL21C and the work we did there. So um, again, great women, great opportunity tonight, and really appreciate the chance to talk to you all. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you. Um, as for me, um, I have lived in Manhattan my entire adult life, uh, over 25 years, and I bring decades of experience to serving uh, the neighborhood in New York. Um, I lived and worked here um, through 9-11, the financial crisis, Hurricane Sandy, which I know all of you have a lot um, going on and, and are thinking about very deeply given what happened in the neighborhood over the years. Uh, and now what we're all living through, which is really the global pandemic uh, where New York City has been at the epicenter. Um, throughout all of that, I brought a sense of commitment and energy and equity to local government um, as New York City has recovered and rebuilt. Um, my, my strength and what I bring to the table for this race is that I'm a problem solver. Uh, I understand what it takes to lead New York City. I bring an extensive background in uh, municipal and infrastructure finance, supporting local projects here in the city. Uh, and I've also been the longest serving elected chair of Manhattan Community Board 7. So I feel very qualified and ready to lead um, our amazing borough um, as your borough president. So a lot of people have asked why, why I'm running. Uh, I'm somebody who is not in elective office, but I believe very strongly that we need strong and new qualified executive leadership for the city. Uh, the current city leadership, in my view, has failed us time and time again, whether it's in our response to the pandemic, whether it's been whether and how our schools have opened and closed. And I've been very out there with our public school parents in recent weeks and months uh, to uh, follow the science on that, uh, on our small business and economic development. And to me, career politicians just haven't brought the forward thinking and actionable leadership that we need right now. Um, in, in my view, uh, I think we need a borough president who has a record, who can balance budgets, who has the right combination of global and local, public and private to solve some really complex challenges in order for us to move ahead, not just in the next year, but in the next decade. I, I like to say in, in um, my talks with people that I feel like New York and Manhattan in particular, I call Manhattan the core of the Big Apple. I wanna keep it that way and I wanna return the borough to what it's always been, which really is the core and the center of how uh, New York City functions and lives. So with that in mind, you know, my, my whole career has been in building bridges. As I mentioned, I've worked bridging public and private, global and local, community board seven. I currently work in an international organization that connects US cities to the world. I'd love to talk to all of you about that and sort of how other cities are working on issues related to housing and transit, sanitation and public schools. Uh, those are things I care very deeply about. Uh, and I do feel like Manhattan is a crossroads. Um, I think we're feeling it. I've been traveling across the borough uh, for the last six months, everywhere from Inwood to Battery Park City, everywhere in between. And it's time to really have an opportunity to emerge stronger. And I've always felt that Manhattan's greatest strength is the energy and diversity of its people. And I'm ready to channel that energy to be your champion for New York City and for the borough that we all love. So, you know, I look forward tonight to digging in a little bit deeper in some of the issues that affect you as a, as a uh, you know, as a club and as a neighborhood. And one of the things I pride myself on is that, uh, I may not know the answer to every question, but I almost always know who the person is who does know that answer. And I think that's a very important quality of being a borough president. So uh, I'm really looking forward to getting to know you a little bit tonight and uh, answering your questions. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, if you don't mind, let me just uh, try to 
fill in some of that stuff. So uh, for those of us who don't have a map right in front of us, Community Board 7 is which, which section of Manhattan? Sure, it's the Upper West Side. So it's from 59th to 110th Park to Park. So uh, Central Park to Riverside Park. And you're, you've been the president there for how long? I was the chair for three years. I've been a board member. I'm still on the board. Uh, I've been a board uh, in and board leadership for 10 years. Uh, and I wonder just while we're on that topic and then I'll hand it over to some hand raisers. Um, tell us something about the, uh, the, the biggest challenge that you've faced uh, on the community board. That's a great question. I mean, I could give you probably 10, 10 things, but um, but as as chair in particular, uh, you know, I think there's a big, um, you know, part of the role of the community boards, which are again nonpartisan. Uh, even though I'm a very active Democrat, ran a very large Democratic group, Democratic leadership for the 21st century for the better part of a decade. When I joined Community Board Seven, I knew that there were voices that were very local. But we're also, it was very and critically important to not be partisan in how you handled um, management of the board. Uh, I would say that issues that included, I think in terms of the toughest issue, um, by far would be implementing the Amsterdam Avenue bike lane, which uh, was something that uh, I sort of negotiated with a lot of different constituencies. There were uh, very well-meaning uh, folks who, um, live, you know, were, were elderly, were very concerned about how um, the bike lane would be implemented, how, you know, concerns about their safety, um, concerns about equity. Uh, and then you had, uh, you know, what has turned out to be even a pandemic, a very well, very well meaning group of transportation and transit advocates who feel like bike lanes are the way of the future. And uh, I navigated both those constituencies very well to get the bike lane passed, but in a responsible way where safety and security was at the forefront for everyone. And, you know, I think whether it was the Columbus Avenue lane or the Amsterdam Avenue lane, which both um, sort of were put in during my tenure, we, the, the best thing we did was bring all the voices to the table and really sit and hammer out solutions. And that's the same uh, sort of leadership style I would love to bring to your neighborhood and across the borough. Great, thanks. Uh, I see a hand up from Michael Marino, an active member of our community board. Go ahead, Hi, Michael. Hi, uh, so that, actually I wanted to ask you about community board stuff. So, um, you know, as you know, one of the, the roles of the borough president is to appoint members to the community board. But my question to you is sort of where does where does the line get drawn as far as what the borough president's oversight into uh, of what community boards are doing um, is and 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 how do you see that um, shaping sort of your role you know as the borough president like you know we I don't want to speak too ill about our board but we have some issues on our board with you know some conflicts of interest that aren't disclosed some you sure. know chair having secret meetings with members of the business community and, and other things. So, um, you know, and oftentimes when member, members of our board go to the borough president's office, they sort of take a hands-off uh, approach and say that uh, it's up to the board to, to solve their own problems, but how does the board solve their own problems when the people that are supposed to solve the problems are corrupt? Look, I think this this points to um, probably one of the biggest reasons I'm running for this office. I think there needs to be reform of how the community boards operate. And I am the biggest fan of Gail Brewer. I think she has done a tremendous job running the board the last eight years. I was appointed under Scott Stringer. I believe very strongly that the boards, again, need to be appointed in a nonpartisan way and need to be run in a way where people who are appointed, uh, you know, I have my life in local politics from you know the better part of 20 years where I've been a political organizer. When I came to Community Board 7, I met a whole new group of people who were not political in nature. And so they were political at a local level, but not partisan. And I think it's really important for community boards to, to adhere to that culture. And as borough president, I'm gonna make sure that the people we appoint to boards and the people we put in leadership positions 
are one, diverse and reflect the diversity and the character of our neighborhoods, and two, are not um, sort of political pawns of um, any, you know, whether it's a city council person or, um, you know, or myself, um, you know, we want the best people running and serving on these boards. So that that is a, a very top priority of mine. Uh, I also have been outspoken on uh, term limits for board members. Um, and I believe that the 10 year term limit uh, makes sense. Uh, it's, you know, it's tough for some people, but I think particularly in my neighborhood where we've had uh, a lot of people who are great, amazing voices, uh, on land use or on a particular issue, uh, we want to keep them involved in the neighborhood, but that may deny another new person a chance to get involved in the neighborhood. And I really want to get as many people involved and engaged at the local level as we can. And that to me uh, means bringing in um, new responsible leadership at the board level uh, as well. Thank you. Thanks. Uh Marion, you're up next. Uh, Marion's uh, the vice president of the club. Hi, Marion. Hey, Elizabeth, nice to meet you. So I kind of have three combined questions. I think they all go together. So one is um, this neighborhood is um, very being a very overwhelmed with um, very tall buildings right now um, and lack of affordable housing. So I, I want to know what you know and think about those two issues in our neighborhood and concomitantly, the lack of green space. Sure, no, those are all great questions and they're things that I've obviously been thinking about um, for many, many, many years up in my neighborhood. Uh, I do think uh, when it comes to development, um, I've said consistently that we can't, you know, our, our, our city and our neighborhoods can't build out anymore and we have to responsibly build up and allow for as much affordable housing as we can in our neighborhoods. Um, when it comes to what's happening um, with green space, um, I feel, you know, when I when I said earlier that I represent park to park, uh, sometimes I realize that we're very fortunate up here on the Upper West Side that we have, um, you know, two amazing mm -hmm. parks and not every neighborhood in the city has it. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, re I respect and understand the discontent that um, the community wasn't heard on sort of the East River Park resiliency plan that I know you all were, were very active in. Uh, and I would advocate for there to be more parkland and more um, sort of more supportive um, ways to responsibly and resiliently build um, to bring more parks area um, supporting the plan in the face of what we know have been really um, large storm surges and rising sea levels. Uh, and I would support that um, and you know, have, a, have a plan that we're coming out with in the next couple of weeks that I, I look forward to staying in touch with you all about. Okay, thank you. Can I ask just a follow up on the zoning and affordable housing? Sure. So do you not think there should be any height limits on, on the way things are built? That one part and the second part is what do you call affordable housing? The AMI that's used in Manhattan includes Westchester and is considerably higher than the AMI in this neighborhood. Sure, I mean, I think the, the first thing is obviously I support the, you know, we need to close the zoning loopholes like mechanical voids um, and more community voices need to be heard. There's no question about that. Um, I don't think that the way um, the AMI has been designated, including Westchester, including other parts of, um, even other parts of this borough makes sense. And so what we need are strong leaders who have had to deal with it in their neighborhoods, who can, you know, hopefully bring the most equity and most um, really responsible um, zoning um, implementation I was very active in the mandatory sort of the MIH and ZQA that I know a lot of you probably voted on and were involved in. Those are all tough issues, but what they require is somebody who's willing to talk to everyone and to try to bring people to the table like yourselves who are gonna bring more middle-class and more um, affordable housing at all levels um, to our neighborhoods. And it may mean height limits, um, but it also may mean building slightly upward if it means that we get more um, affordable housing in a given neighborhood. So that's that's how I feel. Thank you. Thanks. 
Uh, let me just follow up actually, Elizabeth, have you had a chance to take a look at the proposed uh, upzoning for Soho NoHo? And uh, what's your opinion about that? I have, I mean, it's a complicated issue. And, you know, again, I, I go back to uh, sort of overall supporting that, uh, whereas I believe that those neighborhoods are truly historic. I have a very good friend from politics who's the head of the NoHo bid. Um, and I've known her for the better part of 20 years. Uh, she has very you know, distinct feelings about it. I also uh, know people who uh, very much care about protecting um, the historic integrity of their neighborhood in Soho and NoHo. What I would do um, in this case, just like in all the cases in my neighborhood um, as the longest serving community board chair would be to bring these parties to the table to have a real conversation. We are facing a housing crisis as well as people who are dramatically leaving the city. And we need to somehow be able to be a bridge. My campaign has been a bridge um, between local communities my entire adult life. And I wanna continue to do that when I sit down with these communities to figure out how we're gonna, how we're gonna make it work. But I, you know, I think the local residents have, are completely entitled to their say. I think the reality is also that we need to think through how this city is gonna bring people back to Manhattan and how we're gonna provide affordable housing to everyone and do it in a way that's responsible. Thanks. Um, uh, Tommy Loeb, Tommy. Hi, um, as you touched on, um, the community is about to face the uh, almost total destruction of East River Park. It's a $1.45 billion project time of COVID. And you may be aware that there was a community plan that the city then overrid uh, and imposed its own plan, which was uh, what we're faced with now. There was never, uh, the city has never released the value engineering report on which the change in plan was based. And we can't really wait any longer. And I'm wondering, as a candidate right now, would you be willing to call for a pause in this project right now before it goes further? They're currently destroying the, air, you know, the area of Buffalo Key Street, but they won't touch East River Park for a little while. Would you be willing to speak out now and ask for a pause and bring in an independent consult, independent review as they've done with the L train and other projects throughout the city. We can't really wait for the new borough president. We need people to speak out now. And I'm wondering what you're willing to do right now. I'm I'm happy, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I like digging my digging my hands into and really working on. Um, you know, I can't guarantee, again, like I said at the beginning of this conversation, uh, I may not be the smartest person to speak on an issue, but I usually know the person who can get it done. So I've been working with, you know, Gail on, for instance, the helicopter issue um, that, you know, uh, helicopter, um, private helicopters going all over the city and figuring out the right people to bring in the room to end that as a quality of life issue. For this, this is something that can't wait. And, uh, you know, we can't wait for federal funds. We have to convene independent panels. We have to provide sort of the right types of protection for your neighborhood. And, you know, my track record from having been uh, a community board chair, which again is inherently, uh, depending on who you talk to, it can be an unlikable position because you're, you're bringing a lot of people together and sometimes you feel like you're making nobody happy. But in my view, uh, that's the best thing you can do. You need to bring these parties to the table and you need to demand action immediately. And that's what I will do on this um, with you all. And I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you um, either later in this chat or offline about some ideas that I have about how we can bring these communities together to get it done. Thanks. Uh, hey, Bill, if you can ask a quick question and Elizabeth can answer it quickly, then we- You know, we've already addressed some of the issues, so that's fine. I know we have okay. Thank you. Uh, that's fine. So we're, we're at 19 minutes exactly. So I think uh, we'll probably <laughs> cut it right there. Uh, I'm sorry this is so short. I'm always sorry these things are so short. 
Um, but uh, Elizabeth, thanks for- uh, Yeah, and I look forward for to staying this. in touch with all of you. My website is elizabethcaputo.com. Uh, and, you know, again, my local experience, I'm really excited to, um, to work with all of you and, and look forward to staying in touch in the, in the months ahead. I really appreciate your time and the chance to, to speak to all of you tonight. Great. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to our next candidate uh, for this evening. And, and by the way, Elizabeth alluded to this. I did not mean at all to have all of the male candidates come prior and have all of the female candidates tonight. It's just the way the timing of announcements and things like that worked out. Um, but it is kind of nice to see all of you guys here together. It's uh, awesome. Lindsay, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree. Go women. <laughs> I know. I guess I'm up next, Jeremy. Yes, that's right. So Lindsay Boylan next. And Lindsay, if you want to introduce yourself for a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll do the same thing. We'll take some questions. Sure, sure. And thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, the entire Grand Street Dems team. I feel like I've gotten to know folks over these past few weeks, know the issues that really matter to you. And it's been a real joy of my, it's been one of the highlights of my campaign thus far. And it's how I expect to do the job once I get it. It'll be that kind of close relationship. And I'm also excited to see Kim and Elizabeth here. Having gone to women's college, uh, I think the world should have more slates of women running things. Um, and I'm excited to be here. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm Lindsay Boylan. I'm running for Manhattan Borough President. I'm an urban planner, a mom, a wife, and a public servant. I started my career in New York in urban planning, spent the first decade here uh, managing public spaces, primarily parks. Bryant Park, held in Greeley Squares, the pedestrianized parts of Broadway, ultimately uh, to oversee job creation for the entire state of New York as Secretary for Economic Development, which also included the housing portfolio. So all of the state's housing assets. And I helped get the $50 minimum wage passed, as well as led the state's recovery work in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Uh, but it didn't start that way. I came to New York with hundred bucks in my pocket. I moved nine times in 10 years. I did a giant circle around Manhattan. So I feel like I've been training for this job for a long time. Uh, I, have, I, I, I had a bike, but never a couch that I kept through those uh, seven of those nine apartments. When I, once I met my husband, we, we kind of got a few pieces of furniture together, but uh, I've had the typical New York story in that respect. Uh, also in the fact that it's very tough to live here for a lot of people, uh, severely rent burdened, you know, more than half of our people are severely rent burdened, probably more so now. And it's one of our biggest sources of inequity uh, and it affects women, it affects seniors, it affects communities of color much more so. And, uh, you know, I think that's a good, uh, interlude to the next piece. I, uh, you know, some of you may know I ran for Congress on the West Side of Manhattan this past year, and you're probably wondering, hey, what's she doing here now? Is she, does she just want to be candid all the time? And I know it's not that. Uh, I found myself this summer, my husband said, let's figure out what you want to do next. And he said, you know, why don't you relax a little bit, do a little writing. And of course, you can see how that went. But I, I started walking around our city and thinking back to my early days, what inspired me to get into urban planning, including the Death and Life of Great American Cities, my first book. Uh, I read it the spring of my senior year of college when Jane Jacobs passed away in her obituary. I bugged the guy quoted in there until I gave him my first job at urban planning, but I digress. Uh, I started walking the city streets and I was reminded what I love about the city and what I loved about my career, it, which is how I've been building my whole career on making cities work and shaping them after the needs of people. And I knew I had to help. I knew New York is in its hour of need. Uh, it's a tremendous challenge where we are right now, but it's also a tremendous opportunity. And it can be the pivot point for our city, particularly to become more equitable, more sustainable and more livable. And what I mean by that is when we talk about equitability, equ equity, um, nine out of the 10 last upzoning projects considered by the city have been in low income communities of color. Um, the way that uh, big development projects and the ULERP process has been kickstarted has typically been because a developer has an idea. It hasn't been driven by the needs of a community or their desires or their, their wishes for what they want to see. And, and our community, nor community boards need to better reflect the diversity of our communities. I think there's so many opportunities to do that uh, when I become Manhattan Borough President. I'm excited to. Uh, when we talk about sustainability, I think that's probably near and dear to a lot of your hearts, having experienced uh, in Sandy 
front and center um, along the East River in particular. Uh, having having visited the East River Park, um, which I'm sure we'll get to the, in the Q&A period, is is incredibly important that we prepare resiliency for this part of lower Manhattan in such a way that you don't have to be afraid of, of what's going to happen in your community, a uh, hundred year storm, whenever that comes. And also that you can count on the quality of public spaces and getting to my last point of livability to be there for you. You deserve to have green spaces. You deserve to have bike paths. You deserve to have amenities that make the quality of life livable and improve it for New York City. Uh, you deserve to have sanitation levels um, that help keep the streets clean and rats away. Uh, and, and you deserve all those things. I've spent a career, my whole adult life, even serving on two different community boards uh, in, in that time, in my free time, thinking about these issues. And it's my life's goal and my life's passion. And I think this is a unique opportunity for us to do something truly great together. Um, to chart a past future, particularly in Manhattan, which is the central business district for our country. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say I'm New York centric there. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity. And I know you got a lot of things to think about, but the first decade of her career in economic development and job creation, including the portfolio for housing uh, statewide, is really thinking about the issues that matter most to you and how to solve them and how to manage teams, thousands of people across agencies to help get things done. And I'm always gonna be your advocate, not City Hall's advocate. So I'm really excited to have this conversation tonight and uh, have it be a back and forth. So thank you so much. Great, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Bill, I'll get you in right at the start here if you'd like. You know what? I I could wait if other people had had their questions because I think maybe having some other consistency of questions or whatever. I can. I'm good. Well, okay, let me ask quickly. We have uh, yet, so. I, I like your real estate, uh, you know, development stances, Lindsay. Uh, how do you? Uh, what's your position on taking money from real estate? Uh, you know, developers and uh, I'm not know, taking any money. That's an easy one. Okay, well, I try to be quick. I'm not taking money from real estate. I believe you can do this particular job. Yeah, I don't believe you can do this particular job, which is all about land use and zoning and take money from the real estate community. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a hand up from, uh, from Joe Wong. Are you there? If not, I'm gonna move on to Michael Marino then again. Michael, go ahead. Sure. Um, so Lindsay, I'm just curious about, you had mentioned about the uh, community boards needing to sort of reflect their neighborhoods. And I'm wondering what your plan is for that. Um, you know, in our board, we historically have issues with getting representation from Chinatown. Um, right. And I'll, I'll also uh, pose the same question I, I posed to Elizabeth about what, where's the cutoff line in the borough president's uh, oversight of community boards? Is it just to appoint people or do they get involved in grievances? I think, so a few things. Um, I actually think this, this moment in time has presented an opportunity to think about how to get people engaged in community boards and in civic life, frankly. Um, Almost a million women left the workforce in September alone. And that's because of caregiving responsibilities, whether it's for kids or it's for ailing family members. Um, and I think often that's just one great example of, of certain demographics aren't able to make it to a community board uh, on a regular basis and subcommittee meetings if they're all in person. I think one of the main opportunities of this time is to resource and the um, borough president has $100 million roughly, depending on the budget scale, um, to put towards projects that increase community leadership. And I will be resourcing the technology behind that to make it possible not to forgo in-person meetings, but to have a combination once we're the pandemic that allows more people to engage in community board meetings. I think that's a really important opportunity, not just um, you know, for people in caregiving responsibilities, people um, who have um, a disability that prevents them from getting to certain locations easily, and people who just opt out. I think we could take some lessons from this moment in time. So that's first and foremost. Um, on the topic of where does the role start and end, 
I'm really struck and I know we're going to get to Soho No Ho and so I'll just kind of cut it off at the pass a little bit. Um, I don't agree with the plan for upzoning in its current intent, so I would not sign on to it. Uh, I think we'll get to talk to that later, but why I want to why I want to discuss it um, now is I think our whole planning process and thus our development process is really backwards. It's really at this point, whether we're talking about ULERP or we're talking about upzoning or we're talking about any other particular issue related to affordable housing, workforce housing, housing deep affordability, it's all driven by a developer. It's driven by a property owner. And that's just not how we should be doing things. I think we all see the lack of um, message, the lack of intent, the lack of goal in the mayor's office it's kind of issues of experiencing homeless priorities and our development goals should be driven by what we're trying to reach in terms of affordable housing workforce housing deep affordability supportive housing and i have not seen anything that says to me that that's how our planning process has proceeded and whether it's in consultation with the mayor or if it's doing it on our own as a borough, I think that should be the driver for how we're gonna meet the needs of affordable housing. So I would try as much as possible to turn the development process, even if that that, that will include changing the ULERT process to reflect the value of how much housing we have to get and make sure communities, community boards are on board with the goals and finding, their, finding ways to achieve them and working towards instead of um, what ends up happening and has happened in the case of Soho Noho where um, it's Edison Properties or develop, developer driven um, agenda which looks like a carve out, an inexplicable carve out that doesn't necessarily reflect broader goals. And so it ends up being a lot of finger pointing, um, lack of support and very vague um, you know, development opportunities for affordable housing. I don't think, uh, for instance, the um, mandatory inclusionary housing is nearly enough for um, for the, the affordable housing needs that we have. We need something much more aggressive. We need new opportunities, new tools in the toolbox, which I'm happy to talk about, but um, the, the, the role doesn't end with appointing community board members. It's about visioning and um, a give and take and I think we're appropriate um, engaging in from a management perspective on problem solving around uh, if, if alluding to specific members and whatnot. Um, that's something that I would stay engaged mainly because you want the team to work together and you want the team to be effective. But I think that's a give and take with the community board chair um, and the, the district manager and the like. Um, did I answer every question or I think I may have missed one nuance of part of a question. Uh, well, it's, it's fine. I, I know we're probably running close on time, so I'll let Jeremy go to somebody else. No, it's okay. Uh, uh, well, just, thank you, Michael. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, Marion. Joe Wong was before me. If he's still here and wants to speak. Oh, is I didn't know Joe Wong was back. Uh, Joe, are you there? Oh, Joe says, I don't know why it keeps raising. Okay, Mary. Okay, so, so Lindsay, hi, nice to see you. And I would like to ask the same question that I asked Elizabeth. And I know that um, you think communities really should be built around green space. We've had that conversation and um, we have precious little of it and we're gonna have less pretty yep. soon. Um, but the other questions have to do with zoning, the upzoning that's happening in our neighborhood and the affordable housing, which is neither permanently affordable nor deeply affordable for a lot of the residents that live in this yep. community. Right now we're fighting um, the, you know, the towers on South Street. There's, there's, there's um, think something going up right behind me. Grand Street Guild is going up. That's at least affordable. Oh, broom is going up. I mean, it, it's kind of what's happening here is kind of crazy. And we have, we're not even talking about the transportation issues that it's going to bring, but I'm not asking yes. that. But I just thought I'd put it in the air. Yes. So, um, so it, it, do you want me to just respond to that or? Yeah, just what, it, you know, your thoughts. Yeah, so, you know, I took a walk to East River Park uh, yesterday and walked it with some community leaders, um, some who are on the, this, this Zoom tonight. 
Um, I had already had the inclination that the city's plan that changed from something that was community driven and community supported to what they put out there was not going to be sufficient and didn't have a, a rational explanation for why it was changed. I only um, further confirmed that view when I walked this space. And, um, you know, my first job out of college was a, doing master planning process for a 4,000 acre park. So we're talking about different things, but I spent my career about how you talk about parks, how you deal with them. Um, and I don't think the city has come up with a good solution. Uh, and I don't think it's, um, they've given a good answer as to why they changed the plan at the last minute. And I think it's unnecessarily destroying um, public green space. And I know that time's of the essence on this. So I've already spoken about this. I've received some messages from uh, city electeds and their annoyance that I did that. But um, I'm going to be on the side of the community always uh, to the extent that it puts me in opposition with, with colleagues that put it anyways. And I'm going to fight even before I'm in office to help um, save save the East River Park while making it resilient because I, the original plan was resilient. When I walked out of the park, and this is getting to your um, you know broader point, uh, you see just above the bridge, you see all of the NYCHA buildings and you to see this fancy work um, done to basically um, waterproof or provide resiliency for the utilities under the buildings. And you've basically created coffins around all these buildings. And I'm just, and, and, and so it's to, to protect the utilities, which I get, but it means that people can't stay in their home if there is another Hurricane Sandy. And um, it reminded me of these issues, how, how issues that should be connected and people from different agencies that should be working together, how dysfunctional it can become. And I think that's probably why the plan changed, frankly, uh, all along East River Park, the dysfunction and some other agency said, Con Ed or someone said, you can't do that. Or DOT said, you can't do that. My job when I Secretary for Economic Development was bringing um, all these different agencies, whether it was housing, community oversaw, um, Empire State Development, which is EDC at the state level, um, Battery Park City Authority, which I oversaw, Roosevelt Island Operating Corporation, all these different entities together, even if it meant the Department of Ener Environmental Conservation, and figuring out a way that the relevant players come to DIA and come to some solutions. And frankly, it sounds pretty simple. I think you know, in this borough, I think you have, I'm not talking specifically here, I'm talking about um, borough-wide, who are focused on what they're doing, um, but we need someone whose job it is to go beyond the confines of one district. We need someone whose job, whose, whose livelihood is all about how do I bring DOT together, um, NYCHA, whoever you need to, to try and come up with solutions that make sense for people in their communities. So I think that's actually a really big problem that's a causing a lot of things that are unlivable, mm -hmm. um, inhumane, and inhospitable along the management issue. I used to doing that under the most conditions when I was Secretary for Economic Development at the state. Um, so there's that. Um, you talk about affordable housing, um, you know, a little bit south of where we're talking now, but I think it's, I spoke at the community board saying I was in opposition to that plan. I think we haven't even resolved resiliency issues at the seaport. We don't need a two giant luxury towers basically uh, right there. Um, you're gonna see me when I'm borough president. I mean, I think the world of Gail, she was my first city councilwoman. This is not a knock on her. I think we're in a very different time and we're gonna need someone in this role who's willing to, to stake a claim and have an opinion on, on some of these issues once they've considered all of the relevant players and have focused on the needs of the community. And sometimes, or a lot of times it's gonna be to say, no, I don't think we need more luxury housing in the middle of a potentially great depression. Um, we need, if anything, more affordable housing. And now you get to that question we were talking about deep affordability, um, AMI, how to think about these issues. Uh, we don't have enough of any of it, right? Um, so as I said, I oversaw the state's housing portfolio, which was one of the great gifts of my career because I didn't have, aside from those nine apartments in 10 years, I didn't have experience in, in housing, but they're intimately connected to um, uh, economic development, which is why I got that portfolio. Um, so when we talk about how to get more affordable housing, 
housing, we're really talking about how do we make, we're even talking about New York severely rent burdened and spending more than half of their check on their rent, which was me used in my 20. I don't, um, scarcity or contributes, excuse me, to, to scarcity of in the stock itself. Um, what I did a lot of and am supportive of just as a start starting point is uh, really pushed uh, for the federal government your developers just to be doing low-income housing not a few gimmies um, off of luxury housing which is what uh, mandatory inclusionary housing is uh, um, the section eight uh, the vouchers program what people are actually able to afford for the voucher get rate for apartments. So what we have is people who really can't even live in Manhattan, so they can't stay here. And when we talk about who that is, it could be a single parent with kids. It could be a senior, frankly. It's a lot of senior women in our community um, because there's so much that happens to a woman in the course of her life. And she ends up living the longest, having cared for everyone else. And I think we really have missed the boat here in caring for our seniors and particularly women. So we need to be spending a lot more money on, on senior housing. Um, we need to be having vouchers. And then there's a city council bill here for this that actually meet the need for uh, cost of living in a particular area, which is I think in a reverse way, what you're getting at. Um, and we need to be willing to do a lot more um, infill. We need to be willing to be in the development business, not as an tied to luxury development. Uh, the one thing we never get back is space. For, um, and, and I think particular in this moment in time where we are going through a very uh, serious shift in our um, economy and our real estate, we should be taking a pause, assessing what we really need much deep affordability we need, because I suspect we need a lot more deeply affordable and we need more workforce housing, which is just above um, AMI, but it means it's impossible to live here, even in that area. So there's a whole toolbox and tool shed to approach this stuff. I think we don't need is more luxury housing um, with, um, you know, bonus affordability. I think we need to use every tool in the toolbox. There's a lot of federal money that we haven't been utilizing effectively. Um, and, and, you know, it's a nuanced thing that I'm going to explore every possible way. I have very good relationships with both city and state housing. Um, and I'm going to work real hard to get as much of it for us as can, if that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. And that's, um, that's our 20 minutes. So, uh, thanks very much for joining us, uh, yeah. this evening. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been really fun and I appreciate the opportunity and the good questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's move on to our third candidate uh, of the evening. It's Kim Watkins. Hi, Kim. Thanks for coming by. Hi. How are you? Uh, so same thing for you. A few minutes to uh, introduce yourself and then we'll, uh, we'll hop around with some questions again. Terrific. Can we just do a, a little mic check? As Lindsay was finishing up, I kept getting a freeze. I just want to make sure it's not my computer. Can you hear me okay? I, I can hear you just fine. And I, I was also, hers was buffering just a little bit there uh, at the end. But okay. You, okay, you, good. Seem, you seem good right now. Okay, good, good. Crossing my fingers here. Um, well, welcome. Or hello, and, and thank you for the warm welcome. And I'm honored to be here. My name is Kim Watkins. And I want to start uh, just a little bit differently because I want to introduce myself by way of talking a little bit about the principles like centering what I'm going to say around a couple of basic principles through which I see uh, both my, my past and uh, my campaign and the future for this position. Uh, I'll talk, of course, about my, my why, why I'm running, uh, what led me to this decision, um, the issues, and my action plan. Uh, so I am a public school parent. Um, I live in Harlem in an HDFC, and I am a marathon coach for New York Roadrunners, and I run a small fitness business, um, which I came to by way of, of getting married after spending a fairly um, structured management career with some educational companies and a, um, and a nonprofit in breast cancer um, uh, research. So my, uh, my principles 
in the sort of unvarnished look that I am bringing to this conversation, to this campaign, really stem from a view of racial and gender justice, fiscal responsibility, and sort of the embracing of the complications and dirtiness of democracy. Because in, we've arrived at a place in our, in our city, in our state, and of course in our country where it seems easier to voters to cast a vote for a person and hope that all of our problems are gonna go away. And we know that under the rules of democracy, the, it, you know, the contention is there, the uh, exhaustion is there. It can be really, uh, the time it takes to get to uh, progress can, can be longer, but ultimately that's what we signed up for as, as a country, the democratic processes. Um, so to embracing democracy, protecting justice, particularly justice for black and Latinx New Yorkers who have been forsaken in our, in our city and in our country for such a long time, uh, and for women, uh, yeah, you go women. Um, we can talk about that. You know, some of the stories in my background will come out um, in terms of that. And then just thinking about the, uh, the, the utter ridiculousness of the size of our government in New York City and how we arrived at a place where we could spend $100 billion last year and be where we are right now. My why is really stems from my work with the public school system. I'm the president of CEC3. And CEC3 is the Community Education Council of District 3, which is comprised of the 30 schools uh, in Harlem, Lower Harlem, and the Upper West Side. I ran for CEC because of school segregation. I grew up in Tidewater, Virginia in the 1980s in a tiny little town that self-segregated, it seceded from the school district, York County School District, in order to prevent black kids from going to the good schools in where, where I lived, right? I left that and moved to the most diverse, multicultural place I could find after college, some crazy stuff in between, of course. And to my surprise, my kid goes to public school and within the first couple of days, I realized that the school system in here was worse than it was in self-segregated schooling in, in Southern Virginia. Um, I couldn't believe it. It was the very beginning, this was in 2015, it was the very beginning of the Upper West Side rezoning. So I ran for the CEC, I became the chair of the zoning committee and I, thrust my way through a two year engagement process where I got to see firsthand how hard it was to do the democratic the engagement work, right? That dirty work of democracy, the contention, two sides. Don't want, it, don't want changes to happen, do want changes to happen, know that changes need to happen. Um, and, and ultimately we arrive at a plan because it's the one thing that CECs have statutory responsibility over that's to approve rezonings for elementary schools. We get to the plan and all the elected officials from the Upper West Side, with the exception of one, opposed the plan, whispered in the ear of the mayor who has sole control over the school system under mayoral control. And the next thing you know, they pulled the deal off the table. It took our writing a letter, which leaked to the Times and the Wall Street Journal, and like the shame, right? It's the media shame. We've been living through this for seven years now, all of us, you know, the way this, the way decisions get made in this city. But ultimately it did end up going through. And that was the fire that, that um, really struck the match in my belly to do, to do more. I've served three elected terms. I, I've been president for two elected terms. My term finishes. I am not running for CEC again. I very strongly believe you run for one office and, uh, and you, know, you, you kind of finish the deed before you move on to the next thing. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that was really the, the basis of, of my why. Um, my background in 
terms of organizational management through a nonprofit organization, through starting and growing a company to a multi-million dollar company, um, uh, you know, managing 200 to, to two teams of two to 200 and um, the ability to make progress through the uh, engagement and sort of weeding through all of the different facets of complex issues is my the core competencies that I bring to the Manhattan Borough President's race that are not like uh, what I would describe as, um, you know, really great experiences being on community boards. And I know you guys have some questions about community boards. I'm really excited to answer them. But I have the more, more on the ground level experiences. My civic engagement, aside from working, uh, at volunteering for as a full-time job almost, first the CEC, was that I, was, I served as an auxiliary police officer on the, uh, in the 2-4 precinct. Uh, before I got married, I'm a super steward of the of the, the parks department um, and a, a tree street tree uh, captain, and um, and I have uh, I volunteered on several political campaigns. I have not been active um, otherwise in in terms of what I would describe as very very powerful neighborhood and community engagement. But I will tell you that as much as we want to sit around and talk about the processes for you know developing affordable housing for changing um, you know creating public private partnerships in order to reinvigorate our economy and and dealing with issues related to you know admissions in schools the people where I live in Harlem they don't have food on the table right now kids don't have devices in their hands now in December. One of the support groups um, on which I serve is, is something called Parents Supporting Parents. And we're raising money and taking matters into our own hands because the DOE, even though they say they're committed to giving everyone a remote device, we know that there are 60,000 across the city, 60,000 students that still don't have devices in their hands. And here in Harlem, it's more than a, a thousand alone. So I, my action plan on the ground in terms of the issues, which are all the very sim similar issues that, that have already been mentioned. It's schools, it's jobs, it's, it's homes and our health and green space. Um, my action plan is to look at the, the borough president's role from a slightly different perspective to build a team and educate a team around serving constituents and their needs first, developing the issues, developing the, the, the conduit to get to progress with issues first, and then expanding to, to work with the elected officials that are also elected next year and creating the sustainable plans that we need in order to make progress on, on all of these issues. My top priorities, of course, are schools. I am already working on the change the implementation of checks and balances to mayoral control within the, in the city school system. The mayor should not have control, sole control over the city school system, period. We need to change that. We need to change it immediately. It's up for expiration in 2022. And I'm working on that issue right now. We need to get homes for our homeless. We must figure out a way to produce housing first for our, our homeless, our most vulnerable New Yorkers and provide them supports as a secondary and next step that, that partners of course with their homes, but we have to find homes for our homeless. And of course, we absolutely have to get our retail stores open. I'm a marathon runner. I'll leave you with this and I'm gonna turn it over to you guys for questions. I'm a, a coach. I've been coaching people off the couch to run the New York City Marathon for the last 10 years. And as part of my, uh, my campaign, I'm running all 508 miles of Manhattan. I've been on Grand Street. I've been in the neighborhood. Of course, I live uptown and my daughter's in Zoom school. So I'm spending a lot of time running Harlem and the Upper West Side, wherever I can run around my own neighborhood. But I'm running all 508 miles of this island in order to make sure that I connect with every single inch of, of, our, of our borough and, uh, and to make sure that I have a really, really structured sound sense of, of what our priorities are moving forward. So um, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wearing out a lot of shoes, but, um, but it's super fun. But I'm excited for the conversation and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you have. 
Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Kim. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, well, I'll, I see Marion's hand just went up. So Marion, why don't you start us off? Okay, thanks. Um, hi, Kim. It's nice to meet you. And um, I'm really being an anti-racist um, organizer and trainer and teacher. I'm very interested in your ideas about racial equity and, and school. And uh, school segregation is very tied to residential segregation. So the issues of affordable housing and where people can live is extremely tied to where they can go to school, especially if we're talking about public schools. So you can live anywhere if you can afford to send your kids to a private school um, and not have to worry about what the schools look like. But um, because of, we have probably one of the most segregated school systems in the country, public school systems. And we probably have one of the most segregated um, residential systems in the country. So um, add that to the questions about affordable housing and um, how do we uh, you know, think about our history. Seward Park went up after we, um, what, what was it? I forget the name of it, where we basically tore down all the reasonable housing people were living in and then made all these co-ops. And then they said, well, but you didn't let, you only let white people in. So we built the Seward Park extension. We, I mean, we weren't around them, but that's what happened. So that the black and Latinx people were allowed to live in Seward Park extension and the um, white people were allowed to live in these co-ops. So I just wonder how you add that interest of yours to the whole issues of zoning and affordability. Wow, we could be here all night. Just everybody go away. Mary and I are gonna just, you know, like solve all the problems here. Um, well, there, there are a couple of things. First of all, um, within the school system, there, there have been some things that we've at least talked about in the right way under the de Blasio administration. And I, I think that is a, it has been a, an interesting um, and decent start in terms of the diversity initiatives that have been implemented in different um, in different districts. District three was hard fought over um, implementing a diversity uh, initiative for our middle school admissions process. Um, you can't really do that with elementary schools as easily because the tie to you know location for getting your kid, your five or six year old down the street is is you know location specific a bit more right in district one schools there was already an unzoned um, sort of a, a lottery-based admissions uh, protocol. And some of the work that de, de, de Blasio administration did was productive in opening up the space for schools to think about how to bring students of color into students that were predominantly white and, and then to figure out how schools in, um, in, in gentrifying neighborhoods, right? Where I live is a really good example of this in lower Harlem where the, the neighborhood is gentrifying super fast, but all of the white families that go to send their kids to public school, and I was one of them, send their kids to gifted and talented programs. And then black families, if they don't choose their zone school, they choose a charter school. And, and I, would, I would say this, both of those options are a form of privatization of, of public schooling. So one of the main things that we need to do is get private money out of the public school system to diminish the role that companies have within the policy construct of public schools. And Lindsay to spoke like, I mean, I felt like I just took a course on some of the housing stuff that she just talked about. You know, it, it's not so different from the way that um, some of our other public utilities or public basic public goods are, or services are delivered. Public education has been privatized over the years because companies are really good at telling us what, what they have developed and what we need. And so we buy them. We buy tests so that we can test our kids. We buy test prep books then so that we can test, we can prepare our kids to take those tests. And, and then, you know, all, all else being failed, what happened under, you know, Bloomberg was uh, that, you know, here's this huge bureaucracy. We need innovators, nimble small organizations to kick in and, you know, figure out how to, to make the government work more efficiently. And that was kind of the beginning of the charter school idea. Not a bad idea. It became a monster, but that's a different story. But again, the, to diminishing the role of private contracts, private 
um, control over the way that decisions get made is a really important part of helping to, um, to, to stabilize the landscape of public education in, in not just our city, but in our country. And then also um, as it relates to, to housing, the thing I would say about housing is, um, sorry, uh, dog woke up and yawned and made a bunch of noise just a second ago. Um, so the, um, the thing about, about housing is that our teachers, our school nurses, our support staff within our school can't afford to live anywhere near where they work, right? So part of it is, um, is, is trying to figure out how to set aside housing stock for people that work in our communities. It is high time that we have, um, that we are able to, to uh, open up space for the, the, the women and men that work in our, our schools, our fire departments, our, um, our hospitals, to be able to live somewhere close to where they, they make their paycheck. Um, and by, by virtue of one of the issues of gender bias that I work closely on through some experiences in my own life, the other thing that I would say we need to also do is think about home ownership, not just, um, not just rental spaces. And I, I told you at the beginning, I live in HDFC. And that is, if you don't know what HDFC is, it's a, similar to Mitchell Lama, it's a, an equity um, home ownership um, structure program for uh, cooperative housing, <coughs> excuse me. And so when, um, when we think about the low home ownership rate in New York City relative to the country, which is in the country about 67% in New York City, it's about 33%. In Manhattan, it is about 20%. And what's strikingly op oppressive to me is to know that only 20% of that 20% reflects Black and Latinx owned apartments in Manhattan. And that means that all of the, the Manhattanites that, you, that have those you know, low paying jobs, um, work in service, work in home and healthcare, our teachers, our support staff in schools, those are the people that are missing out on the wealth and the, the equity, the um, ability to generate wealth, intergenerational wealth through, um, through their, their, their homes, something that we pride ourselves on in this country, but we've completely closed it off um, for so many New Yorkers. So those are a couple of things that I would start with, which sort of answer your question. But again, we could continue forever, I think. Maybe we will. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Uh, hey, Kim, we've got a couple of, a couple of minutes left. And um, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, you seem to have been um, drawing a, a much broader picture of what the borough president could be doing in Manhattan than I think some of our other candidates have spoken of. Um, but I wonder if you could talk to exactly how those policies and priorities of yours can be directed through an office that may not naturally uh, touch each of those things that, uh, that, that you're discussing. I mean, for example, how does the borough president relate to our education policy or control of schools? Um, how, how do you see that all fitting together for this, for this particular right. job? No, thank you. And I think that's a really important question. I also think that 2021 represents kind of a really um, an open, uh, an opportunity to, to make this position, to give this position the, the you, know, you know, kind of awareness level that, that it needs. You know, people see the mayor on the ballot and then they're like, ah, we don't know what the borough president does. Let's just pick the name of the name of, you know, the name I know the best. And, and then the city council person is, is typically well known when, when good people go to, to vote in their local elections. A lot of people don't know what the borough president does. And I, I stress um, some of these issues because I will, I will say to you as a regular New Yorker, as someone who's living paycheck to paycheck in low income housing, serving the public school system and all of the oppression that continues to oppress vulnerable kids, the majority of, of kids that need the public, the government to do its most basic functioning. Don't give two hoots about the zoning process or ULERP um, or, or, or you know, some of the, the board functions. 
I've been around and, and interacted with our community boards that interface with District 3 quite a lot. Um, and I think that there is a space for this next cohort of borough presidents to take the time, this the moment that we're in, to meet the moment and get into the real action, which is helping policy become a reality for regular people to see and to feel. I, I jog around Manhattan and I, I, will, I will run into people who you know, look at me like I have three heads when I say I'm running for borough president. Nobody really knows what it does, except for you know, the few thousand people that attend these kinds of meetings and regular you know, frequent community uh, education council meetings, et cetera. Um, the people in, in Manhattan that are suffering want us to team up, come up with solutions and make policies happen, make change for them. And I don't think that our elected officials are doing that enough right now. I, again, as uh, I'm sure everyone would say, you know, Borough President Brewer is a one in a million. And I have incredible sense of respect for the ability that she's had to, to advocate on behalf of public schools. We have worked closely together over these last uh, six years of, of my, my volunteering with the CEC. Um, but at this moment moving forward, we have several years down the road here where we are going to need to band together as, as multiple sort of levels of community to navigate the treacherous times ahead through the economic depression, through the reestablishment of a public school system, because it's falling apart right now. Like, don't let anyone tell you any different. The mayor can get on New York One and talk about how great it is that we've got 100,000 kids, 170,000 kids, whatever it is in our school buildings, fine. But we have 700,000 kids that are learning online and don't know what they're doing. And 60,000 kids that don't have devices, right? We don't, we, we have, 65, 70,000 people that are living on the street right now. We have really, really serious problems to, to focus on. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for the borough president to, to kind of come out of its shell and, and be something more than it already is. I am very accustomed by virtue of the Community Education Council's limited um, statutory authority I'm very accustomed to working within a small circle and pushing on the edges of that circle in order to broaden, um, to, to increase the size and scope of influence. And that's the kind of borough president that I wanna be. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks very much for that answer. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the end of our time for tonight. Um, Can I just say really fast, um, I, if there you have more questions, I actually have a little Zoom coffee tomorrow morning. Runwithkim.com is my website address. If you have more questions for me, you can uh, go and sign up to a Zoom that uh, some of my folks are doing tomorrow morning at 9.30 in the morning. Um, but also just in general, my, my policy uh, priorities and agenda are, are also on runwithkim.com. Thank you so much. Okay, great. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, that was a, a great conversation, really great chance to meet all of you. I hope we, uh, hope we get to see you around some more. Thanks, everyone. Good night.